Hey everybody, spoilers for Alien Isolation and all things Alien, so uh, keep that in mind. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Script Department. I'm joined today by Matt Owen, who's going to be talking with me about Alien Isolation and all things Alien. Uh, before we get into that, if you haven't already, do subscribe to our podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, just search for The Script Department uh, and subscribe to this YouTube channel as well if you haven't. Uh, also, check out our website, thescriptdepartment.net, where you can find all the latest projects that we're up to, including script readings from our global network of screenwriters, and also give our social media platforms a like. Just hit the links in the description. Okay, uh, Matt, let's talk about Alien Isolation. Before we get yes. into that... Uh, what's your interest in the Alien franchise? I know you're a big fan of Blade Runner and all things Ridley Scott. Uh, how how nerdy do you get when it comes to Alien? Uh, a little bit nerdy. I mean, I it has a really uh, nostalgic place in my heart just because it was of of my era and um, it, it came off the back of you know Ridley Scott's sort of that that first few films that he did. I, I really really love Blade Runner. And some of the there's crossover in design and stuff into you know the, the aesthetics of, of Alien, and it's just a really solid film. If we're talking about the first Alien, I I think it's one of the most solid films in terms of like all aspects in terms of like the the story, characters, the the, the structure, and the just the the pure sort of originality of. I mean, nobody had ever seen anything like that. It kind of changed the the way we looked at it horror in a way um but yeah but mostly i just love the, the the story and the design of the whole thing definitely yeah i i'm i'm a big alien fan i think alien is one of my favorite franchises uh the first alien film wasn't my favorite when i was younger uh maybe i watched them a little you know maybe a little too young but i i remember aliens the james cameron one blew me away uh, I'll never forget my experience of the uh, like really freaking out at the um, the scene with the the trackers and they, they, all the the dots are encroaching on them and they're like where are they and they're not in the room and you're not thinking they're overhead and then when you realize they're up in the vents I mean I just I remember that scene just blew me away uh, and there was so much about that movie that you could have a lot of fun with and I was a big fan of Alien Three as well um, Alien Resurrection I have a soft spot for just because of how gory it is and how kind of yeah. Um, just stupidly violent it is, uh, which is great. Um, but it was only kind of years later when I really started to appreciate the first Alien film, and it's the aesthetic that I really gravitated towards. Um, and you know, it wasn't really the characters, although I teach Alien a lot now when I talk about screenwriting. I think there's a lot you can learn about screenwriting from watching Alien, but the and we'll do a whole video on the different alien films eventually. So, but the is the aesthetic that I love when I watch the first alien film. I feel like I'm in the ship with them. Yeah. I feel like I'm on the Nostromo. I feel like I can smell and feel and touch the walls and the 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 the, the pipes and the steam and all that kind of stuff. That's great about it. Um, you feel like you can kind of just sense the flickering lights around the corner and so it's just it's just a great great film i really love it um sounds great feels great plays great and I, it holds up in so many different ways to this day i think uh so yeah for me alien isolation was just a natural i mean it was like they they took everything i loved about that game or that movie and just trans transport into a an amazing game. What what was your experience of playing Alien Isolation I, the first time? I totally agree. I mean, I played it a, a tiny bit again. I've only sort of finished it recently, and I just before we popped on, I was I just popped into the the game again uh, to do the the survival mode a little bit. But it was it was exactly that. It was just you're walking into Alien that first film. All the sort of that that sort of analog tech is all ingrained in in the design of everything. You just it's just like a one to one sort of replication of of the design of of alien which again is something i i really love the way that film's designed i think ridley scott he he took a leap uh, a leaf out of um star wars i think because he saw aged aged future which is something again that we hadn't had that much of 
that sort of thing um in it before that point for star wars and and before aliens as well um and and it does feel like a lived in place in the game as well um there's little bits of uh lore and and st- visual storytelling i guess little visual moments where you you see like just a carnage that has happened in a corner of a room or something you just it all adds to the the horror and the uncomfortableness of the the whole place and it's so claustrophobic as well which again co- comes back to that that how claustrophobic that that first film was and that scene that you were talking about in aliens as well which is one of my my favorite bits in that whole film where it's just like oh you're just stuck in this space with this thing that is the you know xenomorph which is just one of the most and again, playing it again recently, I think it's one of the most scariest creatures I've ever seen in a <laughs> in anything. It's like nature, but not nature. It just really plays on this this clash of like animalistic thing and, and metal thing. And it's like, what what is this thing? Um, but yeah, I, I, walking into that onto that ship, walking into that environment um, is brilliant. I, I think you can do a VR version of that game as well from what i what i know but I, i'd love to do that <laughs> i think it was done for oculus i think yeah in 2014 i think it was just done as a a kind of a once-off kind of special thing for that as a kind of a, a testing ground maybe i'm not too sure but yeah I, i've when psvr was announced i was like well surely we're going to get a vr patch for this game or a vr survival mission or something like that and it never happened and um it's one of those things if they ever remastered the game uh i'd love a vr um even not even the game itself but just the just the ability to be able to just walk around in vr and explore yeah. that world that would just be so great i think yeah well i think what you're describing um i think he called it the use a used universe used I think, future uh, that's or it, used yeah. future that's it used, used future. future yeah a future where it had existed for a long time before we ever set foot in it everything wasn't brand new and polished and yeah uh yeah, and and he definitely did draw inspiration from Star Wars in the um, I think he's interviewed in the uh, in that big Star Wars documentary that they did back in uh, yeah. two thousand four, Empire of Dreams, um, and he talks about the influence that it had on him. So there's a you know the whole space trucker vibe, everything is just so um, is so effective in that. And when you were describing you know all those kind of a uh, all those all those particulars there a while ago, I was thinking, is he talking about the movie or the game actually? Because I, I yeah. cause it's the same. It, it, they're so, they're so married to each other. I think there, uh, it speaks to how great alien isolation is as a game, that it is uh, a wonderful companion to alien. And, you know, I would love for Ridley Scott to acknowledge this game's existence more I know he yeah. does. He doesn't. It's not like he talks about Alien all the time or anything. But you know that if you talk to him or if you sit down at a panel discussion about Blade Runner, he'll talk about Blade Runner twenty forty nine. And you know, if he talks about Alien, he's probably going to talk about Prometheus and Alien Covenant. And if he does another Alien film or a sequel to Alien Covenant in a few years, he'll probably be referencing Prometheus and Covenant and the first Alien film and all those kind of things. It would be nice if he. I don't know if how how he feels about the game but i would love for him to acknowledge what this game as part of the story he created or just you know the the world that he's played a part in creating because i do think alien isolation does so much to expand the universe and expand that the lore and the mythology of that world um we'll get into the kind of specifics of it as we go but yeah big big fan of this game i think it's safe to say we both are um so the plot of Alien Isolation is we play as Amanda Ripley, Ellen Ripley's daughter. Uh, where we allude to Amanda Ripley in Alien, the James Cameron Aliens film when uh, Ellen Ripley comes back 50 years later, I think, yeah. and she finds her daughter has died. Um, and she's kind of heartbroken, obviously, and everything. And then she goes off on her mission. And this movie, or this game, picks up 15 years after the first Alien film. She doesn't know where her mother is. She's been searching for her mother or looking for clues or looking for answers for 15 years as a, as a, as a person growing up. <clears throat> and now she's a young woman working for, uh, I think, Weyland Jutani. I think, is she? I mean, she, I assume everybody just works yeah. for the corporation yeah. of some sort uh, in some degree, some degree or another. And she 
has been has to- been told that someone has retrieved the black box from the Nostromo and that it's on a Sikhs Incorporation uh, space station called Sevastopol. And so she goes to Sevastopol with a crew and when she gets there, they find there's nobody around. There's no communication. They all kind of get separated when they try and space jump onto the station. And she meets a... A Scottish character, a very distinct Scottish accent, and he uh, he's all panicky and he's t- terrified there's something around or something killing people. We know exactly what it is. Very quickly, he gets killed as well. And suddenly, she's on a mission to just try and survive. Eventually, she discovers um, that the the people who found the, the... And I'm kind of rushing ahead here, but she finds that the people who found the, 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 uh, the black box... Um, also discovered the planet where the first alien film is, uh, you know, orbited. And uh, they've come into contact with an alien face hugger. Uh, they brought one of the infected people onto the space station. The alien broke out and, you know, that's where all the devastation happens. Uh, she works to escape, but along the way, she encounters uh, androids called... Uh, working joes Joes. which we'll get into Um, brilliant (laughs) brilliant creations and they very slow very 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 threatening almost like terminator-esque characters in the way they move and behave not like ash at all in alien one um is ash from alien one uh yeah ian home yeah then it's yeah and then it's bishop Bishop, Ash and Bishop, yeah, yeah, yeah. So very, very different from them. And the, these are all identical and they're very um, kind of, uh, they're, they're not at all believable as humans, you know, and they, they're kind of very much like mannequins that can move, you know, and they they are uh, very threatened. They've all turned against the humans on the ship and so she's got to combat them and then Wayland yutani show up. And it turns out that the Sevastopol is being sold to Wayland yutani by Seekson and... Now they want the alien that's on the space station. So it's just overcome all of that kind of stuff. And it's um it's all the typical tropes and conventions of good alien fare. It's got the androids that turn on their human masters. It's got the the corporation kind of component sticking their nose in. It's got the the xenomorph, and it's got that conceit as well as to how the xenomorph comes on, comes into contact. That's something that they always do um really well. Uh, well, sometimes they do it really well. I thought they did it well in this, actually, the conceit as to how the alien gets to this place. Uh, so what did you think of the story overall? What was your experience of, of um, I don't know, experiencing the story? How do, how do you feel it compares to the first alien film or um, what kind of deep dive can you offer on that? Yeah, I think it's it's difficult to make a comp- like a really solid comparison between those two just because they're two different mediums so you have to approach things in a, in a different way but um i think the great thing about it is it had momentum through all the sort of i guess they, they break it up into actual missions they, they they sort of break it up into and there's momentum through all of them none of them felt really uh like stagnant or felt like they were slowing the pace down at all it all felt really well paced out throughout the whole whole entire thing I think that the the major issue I I have with it is that the the characters it has this difficult situation where you have to feel isolated <laughs> and you're being chased by this alien hence obviously alien isolation but at the same time uh, it it it's detrimental to your experience with other characters because you don't interact with people that that much in the game but you hear them and and uh, for example, one of the characters whose name totally escapes me um, helps you, guides you through where you need to go. And then again, spoiler, he ends up, you end up finding him with a, a face hugger over his face. And, it, and there's a big war between you and them. He's in another room, a control room. Um, but I mean, this person's helped you all the way through <laughs> this whole section of the game. And I didn't feel like... A, a re- like I didn't really feel bad that he died because I hadn't really experienced him and uh, that much just through sort of a, a voice really. Um, so it's a lot of I guess forgettable characters. Um, not saying that they're bad characters. It's just that maybe then they're, they're under underused maybe. But I think 
uh, and story wise, that's my only major issue with with it. Apart from maybe maybe the ending is quite abrupt. I don't know if you recall the the ending at all. Yeah, so the ending is she. It's a very drawn out journey to get to the ending. Um, yeah. In the sense, the third act is quite drawn out. She has to go into. It turns out there's a whole nest of aliens down in like the lower tiers of the station, and she has to. She has to uh, get through all of them and get to these reactors and 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 de- destroy and detonate the reactors or overpower the reactors or whatever it is. The robots are going crazy at this point, swarming her. Uh, the corporation has sent when well, Yutani has sent some marines or whatever to the station in order to kind of um, do clean up um, and get the information that they need before the place is destroyed. I think. Yeah, it's and she and she basically ends up j- getting out onto a ship that then there's an alien on that ship as well or two or whatever and she has to she basically does a st- space jump and she just kind of ejects herself out into space in a in a space suit and uh, that's basically the only way she can get away from the aliens and they're all kind of sucked into space as well I think and then we see her kind of wake up and there's like these searchlights overhead. Kind of like in Aliens when the um, uh, Ellen Ripley is rescued, but there's no kind of. It's not like there's a post credit debriefing. It's not like there's anything to suggest that there's going to be a, a kind of a follow up or anything. It's just she's alive, you know, she's safe, or what you know we presume she's safe or whatever. It's just people have found her, and uh, it's not really. A satisfying ending i don't think i mean the journey to get to that point is very satisfying i think it's yeah. a, it's a it's a full meal but that is yeah you are right it is quite an abrupt and ambiguous kind of a yeah. direction to take the kind of wrap up the story i imagine very much built around trying to make a sequel without and yet we didn't That's get what one, i was gonna you know? say yeah i think I th- it, it's one of those difficult things with games i think because it's like how much interaction with the ending do you want really do you want to sit there and watch like a 10 minute cut scene or because of this massive journey that you've done or do you want more interaction with the ending and you do mm-hmm. have a, a lot of interaction up until that point but it is like a very brief cinematic at the end that you mm-hmm. see like you said and it feels like it's a shame because it does feel like a it's a cliffhanger that is maybe they had plans to do another one straight after it but Obviously, that hasn't <laughs> materialized in any way at that, that is yeah, point. I, know, yeah. I, yeah. I, I continuously hold it. Every time there's an E3 or a Gamescom or anything like that, I'm just like, there's a little part of me, a little corner of me. Uh, you know, I know it's never going to happen, but there's a little corner of me that just says, I'd love to see the Creative Assembly logo pop up and, you know, a quick little, uh, you know, the, the kind of the pulsing music from Alien, you know, the yeah. just something like that that just... <laughs> Go, oh my god yes we're gonna get it we never will uh, on your point about the um the the characters i think you're absolutely right i mean i couldn't tell you the name of any character uh in this game at all other than amanda i think amanda's brilliantly written i think she's really strong we even get sigourney weaver making an appearance uh through voiceover and she even lends her likeness to a playable character in the dlc um where you actually get to play a scene from the first alien film but yeah, there, there's nothing to write home about when it comes to the characters in this. And I think part of the problem is that we're given a little, as you say, we're given a little too much contact with them. You know, like, I mean, your point was, it seems like we didn't get enough time with them to really care about them. Yeah. Uh, or they don't do enough to kind of make us care about them. But I would also argue that probably we're spending a little too much more time than we need. If these characters are really just there as guides or as objectives for us to get to or reasons for us to get to this direct this place or this place um which is often why characters are written into games it's just we need a rationale for why you have to get to this place or do this thing and if that is the point then maybe less is more actually with these characters and i think resident evil 7 does a great job of that you know i think if we were to compare it to other survival horror games first person survival horror games resident evil 7 which i think is a much more effective horror game in the strict sense 
um, does it really well where there are characters in this game in Resident Evil 7 that aren't characters that are there to be your allies, but they're not there. There's no attempt, I think, to kind of trick you into believing that these are serious characters you really need to care about. Like this police officer is going to send you on a mission and give you so that you can, or, you know, give you a little objective to do so you can get a gun or whatever, but ultimately they're just going to get killed later on, you know? And it's just there to, we're, we're aware of why those characters exist. I think in Alien Isolation, there is an attempt to make us care about them more, particularly because at the very beginning, there's a kind of, a, if memory serves, there's, a kind of a free roaming little section in the ship that you're in before you get to Sevastopol where you can go and talk to the different characters. Um, I might be remembering that wrong because uh, you've played right, it yeah. more recently. Um, I think it's been about a year and a half since I've played the game, but I've played it a lot. And, you know, they're very clearly trying to get you to care about these characters and it doesn't really work. It's, it's very much about, as you say, isolated Amanda Ripley. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh Yeah, I totally agree. I I think again, but again, in saying that, I don't think you necessarily need need to care for them because you care about I mean like I, I totally agree that Ripley's such a great character and crucial to your sort of engagement with with the like any protagonist really, but really crucial to your engagement with the whole game because you really care that this character survives and obviously you are playing this character as well and you want to to survive as well <laughs> but she's um i mean the way it's performed uh, even just the, the the moments where you're really hiding from the 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 uh, xenomorph in like a cabinet or something like that and the the performance of just the panic is really subtle and mm. and all those little things i mean we can go on forever about just talking about the sound in this game which is crazy amazing um this is i've never sort of come across a, another game after this that has such a a well produced uh sort of using sound as a tool that really um engages you with the the whole story i've played games with great sound but this this the way they've used sound in this is great even just the score building up when the alien mm. gets closer is really subtle um it's great but yeah i'm going off topic now but <laughs> coming back to like um uh the protagonist being really a great protagonist and the uh the, the sort of fringe characters they all i mean again spoilers they all pretty much die most well yeah pretty much all of them die i think i think so um, yeah. yeah 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 so i i think it's the only impact a negative impact that has is I don't think you really care that they do die, but again, the argument against that is, I, it doesn't really matter if you you care. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense because you're just again, it does in a way make you think I just need to survive more now. Um, yeah, it adds to the danger, I think, which is um, a, a good yeah. Thing. But yeah. you know what? I would say that I think I wouldn't let them off so easily on the character side of things because. Yeah. One thing you can say about all the Alien films, there are, there are memorable characters in every one of them. You know, not every film is great. Not every film is a masterpiece. But there's always that actor from that film that you remember, or there's always that character that you remember. There's always that line that you remember from every movie. There's always something from every movie that yeah. stands out for me. And I do think if you're going to if you're going to hold your own in like if you want this to be an alien movie or like not sorry an alien like yeah a, a chapter of the alien story a legitimate chapter of the alien story you need to work harder on your characters i think you can kill them off no problem but make us care while they're there or make us we should be able to talk about how great that character was or that character we shouldn't be sitting here saying i can't remember their names even you know um so yeah. i give it you know i a game that i would like in this too a lot and people might kind of raise an eyebrow if i say this but i think the last of us is a very very close kind of mirror to this game in terms of gameplay you know very different game but there are a lot of similarities to it and one of the things that i think the last of us does really well is it gives you minor characters that only appear for for you know a short section of the game but they're characters that you 
that we, we just talk about a lot when, you know, when you talk about those games, those characters pop up more in the conversations than the stars of the story. And I think in, it is a shame that Alien Isolation, which is a very long game and has a lot of characters in it hmm. uh, and, and relies on so many similar conventions and so on as games like The Last of Us do. It is a shame that the writing isn't a little bit better so that we can take something away from those other characters as well. And maybe that's just you and me, but I think it says something when I have to Google characters for an episode called We Loved Alien Isolation, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I really remarkable story, I think. And one of the standouts of the story for me is the contrivance of the alien coming onto this ship. Yeah. It's one of the things that I always... Um, I always kind of I'm a bit uh, nervous about when I go to watch an alien movie like Prometheus or Alien Alien Covenant or uh, you know when I w- I remember the very first time I watched the whole Alien saga I was watching Alien and then I was watching Aliens wondering how are they going to bring the alien back and then I was like oh they just go back to the same planet and then with Alien 3 I was thinking okay and then Alien 4 okay you're cloning now and it was just, I always think, sometimes they get it right. Sometimes it can go a bit off a left field or whatever in order to make it happen. With this, I liked the idea that, yeah, okay, it's they're going back to the same planet, but at least our character isn't going back there. At least, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a narrative that makes sense. Yes, they were sent to retrieve the black box, which you would do. That makes total sense. If a plane crashed, you would go look for the black box. The Nostromo blew up. We're going to go look for the black box. And then they followed that rabbit down the rabbit hole and it led them to that, you know, they, they retraced the steps and it led them to the alien. Uh, nobody gets off that planet untouched, you know, and that I thought that was a very cool kind of contrivance as to how this happened. Um, what did you think of that? Were, were you a fan of that kind of backstory component? Yeah. I I I like the links. I mean, comparing those two different films, sort of like Prometheus and sort of the first couple of Alien films, even the first like four Alien films. Um, I, I think that the, the, the issue I have with some of the the later Alien films is that, for one, I'm not as scared of the Z- xenomorph xenomorph at this point, and the the backstory is quite. There's quite a lot to to take in there's quite a lot to mm. new stuff to take in which is great in, on one hand but the thing i liked about this game was that it like you said it kind of all makes sense and all that backstory you can kind of really it, it gels together it's consistent with especially the first two films or the first three films um so it really it doesn't try and reinvent <laughs> a whole you, you know new universe a new expansion of of alien which is i mean some people might have issues with that but i really liked that because it was it stayed within the 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 boundaries of especially the first film or the first two films um whilst you know not expanding on it too much because again i think it's a good uh one of the the things i really liked about that game actually was the fact that it was really simple in its in its premise it it wasn't trying to sort of be a really really big big thing um even though it's quite sort of epic in its its scope it wasn't trying to really have a really expanded story i mean it's not something like skyrim where <laughs> you know there's <laughs> like loads and loads of lore and stuff and loads of i mean there's little radio boxes everywhere and, and bits of lore that you can happen upon and reading you know what's written in the the, the uh terminals and things like that does expand on things um but yeah it, it's not overdoing it I, mm. I don't think and that's why i really like the simplicity of the whole thing really um and the simplicity of just i mean it's going back to uh, something i wanted to ask you as well is uh, what are your feelings towards like the, the the xenomorph at at this point in like the the films because again again i i wasn't really scared of it in it at that point whereas i used to be terrified you're talking about like, the, the first and second one you're talking about prometheus and uh, alien covenant 
Yeah, in the in the late in the later films, the later ones sort of from the fourth one onwards. I think uh, I think Alien Three didn't really do anything for me because I think part of it is the visual effects. I don't know if they they kind of held up enough to make me really believe. Although we do get that iconic shot of the alien st- kind of coming face to face with Ripley, which is so amazing. Um, alien Resurrection, I have a soft spot for just because I think the the xenomorphs look. I don't know. There's something about the way they behave in that. Maybe it's the fact that they swim or something. I don't know. But it, 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 I have fun with that movie, though I'm not a fan of it. I don't find them scary, though. I think uh, they're more like... It feels more like a first-person shooter, that movie. Yeah. Um, rather than... When it came to Prometheus, I, I really love the giant face hugger at the end. Yeah, you know, the one yeah. that breaks out and, and, and it's like a fight between this mighty kind of engineer and this giant squid thing. And I and it, it, it's so good, I think. And um, we did a talk about Boba Fett um, recently about the latest episode of Boba Fett. And we talked about the Sarlacc pit and how I kind of secretly wished it went a little bit Prometheus in that and just a little <laughs> bit more tentacles and all that. But that's uh, for another episode. But the um, I really I thought they were quite intimidating in Alien Covenant. Um, I yeah, know exactly what you're talking. I know what you're talking yeah. about with the other ones, but I thought Alien Covenant did nail them. There's that beautiful moment, incredible moment where the, I think it's I can't remember who the actor is, but it's uh, they come into the room, and they see one of their people being eaten by this kind of, it's almost like a prematurely developed xenomorph. And it stands perfectly upright and it's just so tall and it looks and it just stares at, uh, at, at the character and the character's got this gun pointed at them and it's rain, there's water dripping everywhere and you can see the red laser dot on the, or the green laser dot or whatever on the alien. And then my, uh, is it Michael? No. Who's the, Michael Fassbender, sorry, I'm yeah. confusing the actor. Yeah, Michael. Michael Fassbender, who's the character you play? David, sorry. David, yeah. David stands behind him. And and it's just this wonderful kind of like, it's father and son kind of going on, you know, kind of relationship there. And then, and I thought that was a really kind of, I was like, wow, that's that's pretty... I don't know, pretty dark, pretty twisted, real great use of kind of body horror. Um, yeah, uh, so I I I'm a I am a fan of the direction they've gone with the design of the xenomorph. Yeah. I think they are finding ways to keep that body horror kind of component alive. I definitely think I am afraid to be in that world um, because of this threat. Um, and yeah, so it's 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 doing its. They're still getting it right for me. I think even if you know I I know what you mean. I think they've overcomplicated the stories a little bit. Yeah. A little bit convoluted, <laughs> definitely. Um, I think very enjoyable still. I'm, I am a fan of them. But I completely get where the critics are coming from as well. Um, I did a video years ago about why Alien Covenant is my favorite Alien movie. And maybe we can revisit this film, actually, and have, that film and have a conversation about it in more detail. But it just ticked a lot of boxes for me as to what I kind of would look for now. And if I was doing a sequel to Alien Isolation, I would like it to borrow some of the set pieces and some of the designs of some of the aesthetic choices of Alien Covenant, for example. But anyway, that's for a different conversation. Um, I wanted to talk about Siegson, the corporation, and, okay. the, and yeah. the Sevastopol, because I love the Sevastopol as a set piece. I love the name. I love the, the design of it. I love how big it is in scope. Like this is a place where people live, where people shop, where people eat. Uh, there's a whole world. This is a lived community, a lived-in community, right? This isn't just a ship that people use to get from A to B. It's not just. Um, there's a lot of people on board. This aren't there? Yeah. Am I am I right in describing like that? I mean, we never really get into yeah. people's bedrooms or anything like that, do we? But but there are lots. I mean, it's way too big for it to just be a a transport station, for example. Yeah, you visit that sort of mall area mm. a couple of times, don't you? And uh, and I think it's a it's a great choice because it does make you think, well, what the what happened here? Mm. <laughs> and and it does really terrify you to think that this this whole place is just you know 
wiped out because of some reason. But yeah, I I, I like that. And and again, it's it's really well done in terms of design. Uh, not going too much into the design, but I guess they they're telling a lot of the the backstory through that design. So, mm. um, I mean, even just going into one of those stores and 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 seeing what what's being sold there that you think oh you know this is how they lived on this this ship without you having to read a bunch of lore and that's that's it's a very visual game surprisingly really visual game mm. um and even like the moments where you say there's a couple of points where you you walk through vents and and come across um areas where people have just been hiding in there and mm. and yeah, you yeah. know they've got all their stuff there and it's like oh and you, you you have to stop and take a look at all that stuff because it does it does tell a, a story of what was going on in, in that those instances yeah before this, did, this didn't just go offline yesterday like you yeah. know that this world didn't just shut down yesterday because of some attack this <clears throat> has been going on long enough for a nest of aliens to grow in the in the bowels of the station this has been going on long enough for um for people to build sanctuaries in the you know in the the smallest crevices they can find out in the middle you know what i mean yeah <clears throat> it's um it's yeah it's incredibly well designed one of the things that i really i mean i just absolutely loved with this was i've mentioned before the uh the working joe robots oh, yeah. and i think it's worth just honing in on one there's one thing about so obviously in this universe you've got the whale nutani androids which are indistinguishable from human beings we you know ash in alien one bishop in aliens uh i think uh winona Ryder plays a character is one of the in alien resurrection gotcha. and then in uh yeah, and then you've got Michael Fassbender's character David in in the in the previous films or in the prequels. They're all Will and Jutani. They're like the Apple or the Android of Androids, no pun intended. Um, they're you know they're the PlayStation and Xbox of these. You know, they're the they're the state of the art. Siegson are not state of the art. Siegson failed to arrive at that same level, and they are the. They're not the knockoff brand, but they're the they are the one that if you got your kids a Siegson robot for Christmas, they wouldn't be happy with you. You know, it's like those videos where you see kids opening what they think are AirPods, and then they realize it's not a they're not the Apple brand. You know, um, it's they are pale white. They look like mannequins. They move very very slow. They all wear these kind of yellow jumpsuit uniforms. And they are they move very slowly, they don't run, they don't they don't they I don't think they have any kind of fast, sudden movements other than maybe to be able to swing a wrench at you every now and again. They're not people who will shoot at you, but they are and they have these kind of red kind of glowing red pupils to show that they're evil. Um and it's very much they've been, you know, they're programmed as helpers, but their programming has been overwritten mysteriously, right? And now they're out to just kill everybody. <clears throat> They, there are these posters on the walls, and this is just a masterpiece of storytelling. There are these posters on the walls that say, you always know a working Joe. And it, is, it blew me away when I saw this, because in this world, not only have Siegson managed to, you know, the, the reference here is, if you're afraid of people like Ash turning on you, like they did in the first Alien film, if, you're un, if you don't trust these uh, indistinguishable androids, people in, or androids indistinguishable from humans, if you don't trust them, well, don't worry, because you always know a working Joe. Not only have you managed to completely turn a negative into a positive, but you did it while rhyming. Which is just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean... I want to just applaud whoever came up with that because the last of us doesn't have anything close to that. Yeah. You know, when it comes to that kind of creativity, <laughs> I mean, that is amazing. Um, and it just completely tells you everything you need to know about where you are. This is the stuff that doesn't work as well as the other stuff. 
this is the the brand that you probably isn't going to you don't want to trust a Seeks and space suit maybe you know or like <laughs> yeah. and you know that there's a kind of a denial about all of this as well from that poster because anybody else probably would have said well it's not just the appearance that we failed on there's probably other things we failed on as well or that we weren't able to kind of get up to scratch and guess what the whole the whole the whole army gets turned evil by you know the flick of a switch you know so it's I love that. You learn so much about that corporation than you ever do about Whale and Yutani in the originals. And in the originals, they're just the bad corporation. In this, they, they run a space station. They have this army of androids. You know exactly where they are on the pecking order. It's, it's phenomenal. It, it's really great. I don't think it gets enough credit. Everybody loves, you know, the working Joe Robots and all that when they came out first. You know, they were a bit of a meme, I guess. But I they are a brilliant, brilliant way of writing a world in a game and manifesting that world through these NPCs that all look yeah. the same, you know? And yet it, they all look the same and it totally distinguishes them from Will and Yutani. It's just, I just think it's masterful. Did they freak you out? They did, yeah. They did. They uh, killed me a fair few times as well. Um, but they yeah they're like just unstoppable they remind me of sort of um something like mike myers or something mm. uh in the, ha- the halloween mike myers not the uh <laughs> wayne's world mike myers um and also, yeah the, the, equally the, unstoppable yeah, exactly um but yeah i i totally agree with what you're saying there and i i had the same experience as well because it's just so simple and so subtle and it it again it does what what you can do in games and what you can do in, in films, vis- visual storytelling, that building the uh, the world visually and and letting you know you, it, it's food for thought. It makes it triggers those thoughts in you and, and makes you think. Ah, now I completely understand mm. what the situation is, what these things are within sort of just seeing a poster, basically, and it, it just all comes together and it's it's really neatly done and um, really effective as well because it's kind of important like story-wise that you have that uh, opinion of like the, the, the company and, and um, uh, what these working Joes are too. Um, Cause in a way I kind of felt uh, the first couple of times you come across them. I, I think from what I remember that they, they haven't, there's some that haven't turned. Yeah, no, they haven't all yeah. turned. Yeah. But yeah. it get but it gets a bit violent after a while and you're like, okay, yeah. Is what's amazing yeah. is the the way that they they pursue you. They don't run. They won't move fast. So you like you'll go like you might run away and go into a room and hide in a locker or something like that, or hide under a table or something. But like you don't know if you're being chased. Whereas with the alien, you always know if you're being chased. But they move so slowly, they don't even appear that often on the tracker, the tracking yeah. device, which I think is. Yeah, also very unnerving. It's the fact that they move so slowly that makes them far more troublesome for you than the alien, which moves very, very quickly. Yeah, and they're just calmly talking to you as well. They're not like uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. saying, you know, stop, deceased or whatever. They're just really calmly talking to you. They have a monotone one, mm. you know, way of speaking, and it's it's even more disturbing <laughs> And, they, and, 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 they, and they'll say things like don't worry i'm not going yeah. to hurt you you know that kind of stuff yeah. and you're like well why would you say that <laughs> <laughs> um the i i mentioned the tracker right i mentioned that when yeah. i was describing aliens as well so the tracker for people who haven't played this is the it's the c it's that device they use in the first alien film where it's uh it's a little thing you hold up and it's got a little screen on it and it has um a little flickering green dot and it just makes a little beep noise and it kind of makes a little bit of a, a ping every now and again if it picks up something in the distance. Yeah. And it's very crackly as well. It's like it's a little bit scrambled, so the sound isn't totally clear. It's very old technology, it seems. And this is essentially your radar in the game. Um, it's your way of determining how what direction the objective is. It's your way of determining if there's something nearby. Um, but there is a risk of using it because in darkness it emits green light and so it can be a source of light and and draw attention to you and 
it can also it also makes sound it pings like sonar in a submarine movie um you know it's it's the uh or in a submarine you know but i'm thinking like crimson tide or one of these kind of things where the sound is used quite yeah. dramatically um to you know suggest something coming close or a, a, a torpedo incoming or whatever and um it's very much the same like you you can tell if the alien is closing in um but it also makes a sound and you know that sound attracts the alien um I, I love that tool. I thought that was the real kind of, uh, in terms of game mechanics, that was the master stroke of that of the game um, for me. It was the thing that totally sold me on this. As somebody who is terrified of survival horror games, I loved that device. I just loved the way it, it totally sucked me into the world. I think that, that device just does so much more than just be your guide. It is... It's like, I don't know, it's, it makes me feel like I'm in the world. Like the way a good driving game makes you feel like, can make you feel like you're in the car just by certain, certain, certain kind of touches. This was that thing that just made me feel like, right, I'm standing in Amanda's shoes right now. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. It's that thing that you have to interact with where you're like. Uh, oh, I better check. You know, I, t- I have to check my tracker. I think I heard something. I have to check my my tracker. Or it's like you're checking it every couple of minutes or something. So it, it's it's a thing you need to interact with constantly, and it that's it really draws you in because you've got this tool um, that is kind of saving your life in a way. <laughs> so it's uh, it, it's really really immersive in that sense. And I, yeah, I totally agree. I I love that thing, even though at so- some points where it, it really becomes like looking you know, scrolling through Twitter where you have to do it, pick up your phone every two minutes and check, right, is there an alien around or, or am I going to die now? Um, yeah, but, but it's, you, it's a great tool. You are right that it is the interactivity. I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it as I was describing why it makes me feel like so, but you just hit the nail on the head there. It is the, it is the fact that you, you are checking this. And I, I, I made a note about comparing it to other radars in other games because if you think this is kind of your radar in this game you know one of the things that uh i mean i love the metal gear solid franchise so much but one of the things that i don't enjoy about those early games is how dependent i am on the radar and how the those radars are so detailed that i don't even feel like i need like there are literally moments in the games where i used to just 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 because I could, I would play the whole section without even looking at my character. I would just look at the radar. Mm. And it, it wouldn't matter. You know, I knew if the enemy could see me or not. I knew where the corner of the wall was. I, I knew what direction I was facing. Like, I didn't even need to look at my character. The, I think radar in games can oftentimes be such a crutch and can be such a, a, a distraction from, or such a, it can just, you can just play the game through the radar and there are a lot of games that 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 kind of do that mm. this is there's no interactivity with it you know it's just a sh- it's just like a less detailed cleaner more stripped down version of the map and i think it can come at a hindrance because you could be like oh well this 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 game isn't that intimidating because i know exactly how many enemies are there there's like two over yeah. there in the corner you know um this is such a great interactive way of working with your tools and radar is a tool you know and I, it just it really impressed me how, how how functional it was how effective it was it's that thing of you have to pull it out it's not always there you have to check it and oh yeah i heard a sound and like you say i'm going to check it and i had so much so much fun with that and it is that thing of like you can become addicted to it and they will come at a cost because the enemies will see you and hear you yeah uh <laughs> so it's such a brilliant um brilliant way of utilizing and then in turn the other great achievement of this game is the ai of the alien itself now i know we're getting into kind of coding side of things here but i i'm talking about it because i do believe that this speaks to character as well right so um how much do you know about the ai of the alien because there's uh, a kind of there's been a lot written about it I'm not. I'm not totally sure, but I. I. I think it's a really well developed. It's a great choice for a start because every time you 
load up it's going to be different i mean you die i i died it myself like uh, probably over 100 times in this this game easily um i think i got an achievement for that possibly as well yeah you but, do um, yeah 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 <laughs> But it's, I mean, you could load that, you could die, load that game up again uh, at that save point, and then it's totally different. You'd have it, the great thing about it, and and again, it, like you said, it speaks to character, is that you don't know where this thing's going to be. And then it, it, going back to the radar, it forces you to use the radar. Um, it makes it scary because you don't know when it's going to come out. Uh, the only thing I sort of, I remember playing it for the first time and I likened it to, nemesis in uh one of the resident evil earlier resident Res evil, resident games evil 3 i think is it yeah oh it's resident evil nemesis isn't it <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> and yeah <laughs> and uh and yeah and and i remember having that same feeling of you don't know where this thing's gonna come out of, uh, but you know it could come out of the ceiling it could come out of a vent it could come at any point and you kind of might just hear it the last second you might hear it coming and a way off but it's always different and i think the whole game hinges on that ai and mm. the, the fact that this alien is not just something that's doing a you know a, a, a pre-programmed yeah. loop or something i mean you could be sitting there for ages you know waiting for it to just get out the way so you can move because the, the movement is always different and that's it just an amazing thing definitely it is uh so i mean if you've never played a, a video game before or if you know you're unfamiliar with these types of games normally you would have npcs non-playable characters following a predetermined path uh and, and and it's becoming i guess less so now as as game design evolves but you know it's still you know it's still part of lots of games where you know even tomb raider games or uncharted or whatever the characters will generally always follow the same path because yeah. They they want to create a. It, it's really about beating, the, having fun beating these enemies. You know, can you get the headshot? Can you stealth kill the enemy instead of just, you know, shooting everybody from afar or whatever? You know, it's a, it, it it's it's it depends on what the game is kind of asking of you. But because this is a game about avoiding an enemy like the alien, it's it's programmed in a way where, yeah, you can't learn this game you can't master this game you know oftentimes the objective of a game is to master the game this that's not the objective here the objective here is to survive in the true sense of survival horror um and one of the great things i was re i was doing some research about this um one of the ways in which this alien is created the alien has kind of two scripts running at the same time now i'm sure an expert could break that down even further but my understanding is that you've got what's called the director AI, and then you've got the alien AI. Um, and the idea is that the director AI is all about uh, understanding the player's experience, which is so advanced when you read about it. It's so incredibly brilliant. Uh, in, in, I'm not sure how technically advanced is, but the idea that this is what they're thinking of, the game designers, when they make this. Is, is just so impressive to me. Um, the idea is that they want to think about what's the experience of the player. Um, how long have they been in this situation? How long have they, when was the last time they, they, they actually progressed in the story to a new checkpoint? Or, um, you know, are they, I don't know, maybe low on ammunition or whatever. You know, they're, they're assessing you as a player. How far away is the alien from you? Um, how long have you checked your 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 tracker for you know anything that they're trying to gauge yeah. a sense of where you are in relation to the alien and then the second side the alien ai then is very much about the alien's characteristics it's the the different actions that it can take at any point and the idea is that apparently there's over a hundred actions that the alien can do at any one time and that could include um, killing you it could involve um dropping out through the vent and revealing itself it could involve running away to the other side of the map it could involve knocking something over with its tail or uh looking under a table all that kind of stuff and a lot of these actions are locked off until you do something so if you look if you hide under the table and the alien sees you or you know let's say you you um 
you climb out from under the table and the alien sees you, or you go under the table and the alien sees you, that unlocks the ability then for the alien to look under the table. This is just an example, but um, the idea being then that it appears to the player that the alien is learning from your behavior. But really all it is is that <clears throat> it's uh, one is triggering the unlock of another. You know, um, If you use a, a distraction device, like a noise distraction device to create a, a diversion, um, you know, the next time the alien will be less inclined to believe that, you know, and, and again, this is a feature that is unlocked because you did it, but then it worked that idea, that side of the alien works in conjunction with the director so that the alien isn't just constantly hounding you. The alien don't, won't always look under the table because it's like, well, I looked under the table last time and I need to give the player a rest. I need to give the player a chance because in a weird way, the director is the, it's kind of like the, the, I don't know, the restraint on the alien. Because otherwise the alien would just kill you every time, you know? And it's just, I love the thinking that, that went into creating this. They could have easily made it a character that just randomly appears. And there'll be just so much frustration then when, it, when you're just constantly being cornered or whatever. They could have easily made it in a way where it just always follows the same path. And it's just about you learning like Outlast, which I didn't enjoy at all, for example, because for that very reason. Um, but I love the idea that this character, this, a, this, this non-playable character has true character in the sense of because the AI gives it character and you as a player give it character. Like, have you ever seen the Xenomorph look under a table in a movie? <laughs> You know, have you ever seen the xenomorph actually jump out of a vent to surprise somebody or, you know, any, you know, those kind of things or a xenomorph burst open a locker where somebody's hiding. You don't see those things. And maybe they might not look good in movies, but these are things we don't assume the character can do. The xenomorph can do, but now they can, because in this canon story, your interactions with it have given it this extra characteristics. It's smarter than we realize because of what Creative Assembly have done. Yeah. And I just love that idea and that respect that they gave to this character because even though it's a different xenomorph than the one we saw in all the different movies and all that, there's loads of them in it and all that, but just the idea of they've enhanced this species. And in order to do that, they actually created this really complex AI and I just don't think it gets enough credit. I know I've prattled on a bit there with that, but <laughs> it is such brilliant storytelling. And if that is how you write great characters now in games, then go for it. Like this yeah. is AI storytelling. It's brilliant. Uh, yeah, I think it's it, the whole game. The whole game. The whole thing hinges on on that as well. And uh, I mean. Just to sort of add to what you're saying, it, it's it does give it a character. It does make it feel like it's a living thing, and that has thoughts and can find you and will be looking for you. And um, yeah, it just feels real, and and it has characteristics. It has things you can notice if you just sit down, hide under a table, and watch it for a while. It's it just feels like a real thing, and I think that's really important for the for, for one the fear factor of just being scared of this thing but also it bringing it to reality again just makes it uh, feel like a living breathing sort of world and this idea again that you have to use this device that doesn't always work <laughs> to uh to try <laughs> try and sort of you know see if this thing's near you and it, all these things tie together really neatly and yeah i think it's a really really well done piece of uh, it, it's a and, yeah, yeah it's a great complement of game mechanics and yeah and uh world building um and you know it has actually informed alien i said i played it that game so many times it has actually informed my the way i think about the xenomorph when i watch the alien movies um hmm. you know it i i do think about you know when i see the first film i do think about my experiences of playing alien isolation and i'm incorporating some of my expectations into that, um, which I think speaks volumes about the lasting impression that the game can leave on you. Um, one last point that I, that I wanted to make is, you know, right now 
the term requel is co- is being thrown around a lot. Remakes that are not really remakes, they're sequels, but they're pretty much just remakes. Uh, you know, we've seen it with Halloween. We've seen it kind of with the new Matrix movie. Uh, we've mm-hmm. seen it with Scream and so on. Um, this to me is a great example of how you could do a remake of the first film in a way that is absolutely not a remake at the same time. You know what I mean? That it can tick all the boxes at the same time. Like if a studio came and said, you know what, Ridley, we're only going to make, we're only going to let you make alien movies if you remake the first one. We just want to re- do a requel of the first one. This is it. You know, it's a Ripley character. It's, uh, it's going on to, you know, it's, there's an alien or, chasing us and we need to come up with a way to stop it and we need to do a bunch of different things in order to kind of corner it into a place and blah 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 it has all of the same tropes and conventions you know it revisits the planet it gives us the the space jockey you know you get that great moment where you get to go onto the planet and see the space jockey like and, and in first person great moment it gives you the corporation it's got Will and Yutani it's got the the android you know attack and all that kind of stuff and yet, at no point did it feel like, and it literally has Sigourney Weaver in it. And at no point did I feel, oh, I've been here before. Mm. You know, I'm retreading old ground. Oh, great. How imaginative. No, I, I thought this was just totally great. And it's a story that is very movie friendly, I think. I think you could very easily tell this story as a movie, as a two-hour movie. Um, I've always joked, this is the best alien movie never made. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and... And to me, this is the recipe. Uh, if I was ever commissioned to write one of those kind of requel stories, I hate using that word, but this would be, it wouldn't be Halloween or it wouldn't be Scream or it wouldn't be Resurrect- Matrix Resurrection or any of those kind of films that I'd be thinking about as the, as the template. It would be, I'm not you know, judging any of those films or anything, but it would be this that I would use. Because I think it's so imaginative and yet not at all unfamiliar. Yeah. Um, final yeah, thoughts, Matt? Uh, final thoughts. I think, well, the, I think you hit the nail on the head with, with that, really. It's, it's, it's coming back to, I mean, the first question why you like this. I think it, it does all those things. It takes everything that is good from all those films, really, even sort of three and um three and four and i guess maybe some of the later films but definitely those sort of first three films first four films it takes all those great the things that people care about in those films or the things that really worked well and puts it all in this one one sort of story uh, you have like some more actiony set pieces that are, you know from aliens um but they're not over you know first person shootery i mean this very rarely do you use a weapon in, in this game as well which is a, a great choice to have because this there's no stopping this thing that's after you really um and it takes out all those great elements that i really personally really like from all those films and i thought really worked well and just puts it into this one one package and yeah if they had to reignite the franchise again in whatever word you want to call that that sort of approach it would be a template i think this it would be it's it's the best approach to doing that i think where do you think do you think we will ever get a sequel the story doesn't isn't under any time constraint i mean we don't know when she's rescued uh she could be rescued 10 years from now wouldn't matter um you know we could still make the game where do you do you think they'll ever revisit it or do you think uh where could it go yeah that's what i i've been racking my head uh, racking my brain to think where it would actually go after that um and i would love to have a, a sequel to this i think there's a lot of call for it i mean it, to me this is like the film dread where everybody wants a sequel to that that <laughs> that film uh, but it's probably never going to happen. But I hope, I really hope they do a, a sequel to this, and and I'm sure they will surprise us with a something again that is familiar but goes in a new direction. Um, yeah, 
it's been a few years. 2014, the game came out. Since then, there has been an Alien Isolation uh, app game, which is more about you're like opening and closing doorways and things like that and trying to keep the alien out. You're kind of watching it all from security cameras, which sounds like a great concept. I haven't played it. I think there was an Alien Isolation comic book as well, but I'm not too sure if that was just the story told through comics or if it's actually continuing the journey in some sort of prequel or sequel way. I, you know, I was thinking about Neil Blomkamp's approach to Alien that he was going to do a few years back, and we we saw and released concept artwork for Michael Bean and uh, Sigourney Weaver coming back, and this was meant to come af- after Aliens, uh, I suppose, maybe to replace Alien Three and Resurrections. Maybe uh, it seemed yeah. like it was going in that direction, although I guess it could happen in between Aliens and Alien Three. We don't, it, I don't think it ever fully states that. Alien 3 is is that they didn't do anything before. I mean, I guess it is obviously, isn't it? But yeah, so we got the Neil Blomkamp story and Blomkamp. I think you could do, I think you you could, obviously that franchise was taken away from him. I think Ridley Scott probably just wanted to do his prequels. Uh, But I think there's definitely room to incorporate the idea of Sigourney Weaver, Michael Bean returning in video game form with Amanda Ripley. Imagine Amanda Ripley fighting or sneaking her way through a corridor uh, years from now with her mother and Michael Bean or yeah. new or even Newt as a, as a, as an adult, you know, like I think there's so much you could do with that, that people would genuinely lose their minds over and you could get Sigourney Weaver back and you could get um, Michael Bean back to, to, to play Hicks. And it's Hicks, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Hicks. Yeah. yeah. And and it would just be a fantastic I think I think you could do a really fantastic you get this I know I'm sure a lot of people from Creative Assembly have moved on to their roles and jobs and other studios and so on and so forth, but you get a great writer in, or you even partner with Blumcamp to say, look, you're not gonna get your movie franchise here, but you can get you can do this through video games. Seems like the kind of filmmaker that would that would value that medium. I don't know. I think there's definitely a future there, and uh, and a very easy pitch. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm definitely sold on that. Definitely, yeah, <laughs> I would play that. It's not unprecedented um, to have El- or Scorny Weaver back, and the concept artwork we saw looked very video game friendly, like yeah. as in like it literally looked like video game concept artwork. Uh, so. It's we already have an idea of what it could look like, even you know. Um, yeah, I mean, a parallel story or something like that mm. that leads up to I don't know, maybe uh, a third game, even if they made all that kind of parts of DLC or something like that. Um, that would be, I mean, that would satisfy me definitely, but uh, that story would be just bringing that, that Blanc Kemp sort of ideas back would be great because i re- I really wanted to see what he would do with yeah i think a lot of franchise people as well yeah. and I, but i don't think anything that we were ex- i think the stuff we were excited about isn't medium specific i mean obviously it's yeah. visual visual medium specific but i don't think it has to just be a movie i think it could be great tv or it could be a great game as well um now yeah. more than ever and you know what take the ai idea to new levels and make your your ally, whether it's Ellen Ripley or Hicks or whoever, like a really, really intelligent AI, more so than we've ever seen before in other games, where they're able to outsmart the alien and the alien's able to outsmart them, you know, yeah. and, and you're kind of in the middle neg- negotiating all of this or something like that. I think you could, you could have a lot of, uh, make it the best kind of um, ally game. I don't know what you would call it, where you've got these kind of allies on your side following you through. Uh, you know, com- companion games or whatever. Like, make 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 the best one of them. Yeah, that's also a great alien story. Anyway, uh, I think we've rambled on long enough, Matt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks very much, Matt, for coming in and having a chat with me today about Alien Isolation. Uh, do check it out if you haven't played the game, guys. It's really great. Um, so, uh, thanks everybody for listening. 
And uh, like I said before, if you haven't, do check out our website, thescriptdepartment.net. Follow us on social media. Hit the links in the description. And if you haven't, make sure to subscribe to our podcast and subscribe to our channel as well. Just search for The Script Department. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.